Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. We are moving on to the next um, session, the panel discussion of the conference, uh, the GTA conference. The topic is human-centered innovation in times of global crisis. Here with me is actually four um, uh, panelists from two countries, I would say. Um, and all of them are members of the Global Design Thinking Alliance. Uh, what we are trying to put a spotlight on to in discussing this topic is how did the global crisis of COVID-19 played out in different facets of life? Uh, the inspiration of this topic is by witnessing the dance of human needs and innovation. Uh, how does that play out in different, different continents or even countries and different levels of life? Well, we covered already in the two keynote, keynote sessions, the story of public sector innovation and the global pandemic this time around. Uh, hopefully we can also hear stories from businesses, uh, researchers and community. And to achieve that objective, I am here today with four panelists and allow me to introduce who they are now. Um, uh, I believe that we are going to have a gallery view uh, or do we want to spotlight each of the speakers right now? Um, I'll go ahead with introducing the first um, speaker uh, or panelist, which is Professor Yvonne Miller, uh, a professor of design psychology, and director of the QUT Design Lab in the Creative Industries Faculty. Very interesting uh, um, area there, design psychology. Um, her research focuses on how to design environments, build technical, social, cu cultural, and natural that better engage and support all users. Her most recent book is Creating Great Places, Evidence-Based Urban Design for Health and Well-Being. The next um, panelist with us is Juliana Proserpio. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, is an entrepreneur and educator. Uh, she is the co-founder of ECOS, an innovation lab and its business units, School of Design Thinking, a school that puts innovation in practice and ECOS, the innovation projects. Over the last nine years, Juliana has worked to develop an innovation ecosystem in Australia, Brazil and recently Portugal uh, to foster the design of desirable futures. Welcome on board, Juliana. Um, so we have one um, representative of the male. <laughs> Dr. Satyan Chari is Program Director of Clinical Excellence Queensland Bridge Labs. Um, he is leading the healthcare improvement using a human factors systems and design thinking approach. He is also an experienced clinician and occupational therapist and a senior safety quality and systems innovation leader. So that's quite a few hats that you're wearing, Dr. Satyan. Um, last but not least, we have Mrs. Shui Lin Lin, the director of the Design Thinking Innovation Center at the Communication University of China, CUC in Beijing. And she's also a courtesy professor at Center for Design Research, Stanford University. Mrs. Shui has um, an interesting background of computer science and digital media art. And this is the fun part. She is an expert of online game content review committee <laughs> of the Chinese culture ministry. So it's very, very cool and diverse uh, panelists that we have uh, today speaking about the topic human centered innovation in times of global crisis. Um, let's uh, start with the first round of the question. I would like to ask this question to Yvonne. Um, but before I start, all the panelists, we are ready? You guys are okay? Okay, let's start. Prof Yvonne, um, as you may have experienced yourself, the world faces a global social pause and in some extent suffers from this connection to human interactions. As a designer, professor, and so many other hats that you wear, uh, what do you think designers and communities can learn from this global crisis of a pandemic of this scale? That's a great question. I mean, I think we need to acknowledge that we are actually living through history now, that we haven't really, you know, in our collective memory, we haven't lived through anything like this before. And so it's been really hard for us to adjust, but I think we're adjusting in really good ways. We're coming together 
And I think it's having an impact on, definitely having an impact on how we're living, but I think we're um, coming together in in so many different ways and often in better ways. So whilst people are finding sort of the shutdown of the lockdowns really challenging, there are a lot of people who are trying to make the most of, of, of being at home with children or engaging via Zoom, you know, learning and talking to neighbors and connecting with people that they hadn't before. And actually uh, for many people, they're exploring their local neighborhoods. So actually, you know, in the time that are allowed outside, depending on what your different rules are, they're actually engaging in a different way in local neighborhoods and with public space and seeing the value of having quality public space. So I think it's really gonna highlight a social justice agenda. Um, there are some neighborhoods and there are some communities in some countries where there are very good public spaces and opportunities for people when they access, leave their homes that they can actually, you know, easily have quality exercise and quality social interactions. And I think on the other hand though, there are, we're seeing some challenges, particularly in say high rise apartments and buildings that have not been designed with a pandemic in mind. Okay, homes are, a, you know, they're a fortress, protect us traditionally from animals and from the weather. Um, and we haven't thought to think about that we might need sensors for lifts or for doors. And so as designers, we have to start thinking about these things. We need to think about flexible adaptive design, both in the interior environment and architecture and in our public spaces. Um, and we need to also start to think about much more about uh, by design that is designing with nature because people are craving that and they're realizing you know when they're at home inside their homes they're realizing that they're either designed well for them to maintain some kind of normality and exercise and use balconies and and, and be connected to the world or they're designed in some ways can be literal prisons for people and so we're seeing all these challenges uh but they're also opportunities for us to think to think differently and design smarter smarter homes and places and particularly spaces that bring people together um in my local neighborhood for example um they um kids drew little you know chalk on on on, on pavements so people could do hopscotches and they they did little challenges for running and who could run the fastest so even though you couldn't play in the playgrounds there was a sense of community and there was a whole you know the teddy bear hunt people putting teddy bears on fences and so we've got to collectively you know harness that and make sure that the positive changes that have come so the reduced and you know reduced use of cars and transports and um you know benefits for our planet um come out of this this really unprecedented crisis I agree. I agree. Um, when you're talking about the high rise design, um, finally, my current place, my balcony is only one and a half foot wide. What do I do with that? So yeah, I it's a challenge. <laughs> I can't even do anything. It's even even hard for me to even hang my laundry. So that's funny. Thank you for that, Prof. Ivana. I love how the, the kids are playing and being creative. And I completely agree. I feel like this pause or the lockdown inter interaction actually help us to kind of allocate some time for self-care, um, not just for individuals, but for family. And that is basically the building blocks or units of a community. So I think a happier individuals, happier family brings like a happier society. That's, that makes sense. Thank you for that, Prof. Yvonne. Uh, the next one is Juliana. So Juliana, as the co-founder for ECOS Innovation Lab, you have been supporting organizations and entrepreneurs to accelerate um, cultural change, creating new services and business models using human-centered methodology. Um, what is the most interesting trend you see in organization uh, in adapting to this sudden shift due to the, to the global crisis that impacted globally? Um, I think that there are many things at play here. Thank you for the, the question, Kama. Um, I think that one of the things that we have been seeing is that, of course, uh, now that everything has been put in check, what are the things that are going on? What is going to survive? What are the new trends? What is going on with our users, with our clients? Is that all of the organizations are needing to adapt and pivot quite fast, right? So I think one of the key things is that empathy that is a value of design thinking obviously has become something that uh, teams are actually being more empath empathetic between each other, right, in, in internal organizations. So now everyone kind of uh, meets uh, the their colleague in their homes. So you kind of start meeting 
everyone's child's or dog's or homie space. And then you kind of create this connection that maybe before you had these professional mask that you wouldn't be interacting as much. The other side, I think it's very interesting is that because of, of the pandemic um, and because in moments of crisis, um, all the users needs, they become amplified. And also things that didn't make sense before, um, suddenly uh, people drop it and they don't wanna consume your product anymore or your service anymore because it's not necessarily, it's not desirable enough it's not intelligent enough, it's not frictionless is enough or something like that. So people just don't care about your offer or whatever. So you as a organization, you need to start looking at that um, and really try. And now people are really open to give their opinions because we are now uh, almost uh, many people are in isolation. They're working from home. So you are interacting in person less than you were before. But one of the trends from it, from isolation, is that people actually want to connect more, right? Because many people are in isolation, on the contrary of what you would think that everyone would be stay put in their space, because we now have this kind of interaction that now is happening via Zoom, but it could be happening by phone or whatever, people want to connect more. So because people want to connect more, and there are some things that were extracted from your normal way of living, your desires, your needs become amplified. So it's much easier for these organizations to um, identify what are the user's needs, the client's needs. Um, and of course, um, one thing that it's interesting is that now uh, because of COVID and everything else, the increase in the adoption of digital services and digital products are making organizations increase their, uh, accelerate actually their digital initiatives. And what I think it's interesting, I don't know, probably the audience has, has seen that or not, but there was like a meme going around the internet these days that, that asked, um, what made your organization digital? And then there was a tick box, a check box. Was it um, an internal uh, digital transformation? Was it a consultancy or just was it COVID? And then of course, everyone was just thinking that it was COVID, right? So there is this acceleration of things and we work closely with many organizations designing uh, their futures, their desirable futures. And what we have been listening is that for desirable futures, what is happening is that what the pandemic around is just fast tracking what we have been seeing, right? Um, and these things, I think, um, being human centered and using design thinking uh, to accelerate innovation and to create intentional, let's say, change, just not, not following what is possible or what is a trend, but actually trying to create intentional change, being human centered, being connect, connected to humanity, per se, right? Um, and this moment that we're living, I just heard. Uh, um, an amazing futurist called Genevieve Bell. She's Australian as well. Um, and she was talking that we are now living a liminal time. And this is an anthropological term. And it means that we are a, a living a time between times, right? And in a time between times, um, it means that it's time for us to shift, to change, to adapt, to amplify and understand better our users and clients and humanity needs and experiment. Right. So I think that these are one of the things that I have been seeing um, a lot. And of course, trends are there. And I, and I think that many things are happening. But how do we combine the weak signals that we're seeing and the signals that are changing with desirable intention right, from, from society? Thank you so much, Juliana. Um, I couldn't agree more with all the points that you've just said. But one of the key things that I notice is hearing from you um, looks like the dust is suddenly settled for our vision and perspective to be more clear about what are our needs and what are the humans need. Suddenly we are, we have that kind of time or even space to have that clarity of what are our needs are and be able to reflect that truly. And I feel like that's, uh, it's almost like a perfect time for us to practice design thinking, <laughs> but there's also, 
uh, the other end of it, that people actually really struggle to be within their own head and needs. I feel it's also something that some of the organizations I've also witnessed, they find it troubling to kind of like be human at the same time. So that's very interesting. Um, I really like your point about the time inception, or I call it the incept time. It's almost like the inception movie, but time in time. Thank you for your view, Juliana. Next up, um, we have Mrs. Shui Lin Lin. Um, I have a question for you. I'm actually quite excited for this. Uh, globally, uh, one of the most crucial but demanding aspect in managing and going through any crisis is actually communication. Um, in the aspects of communication design or in, in your view, uh, what are some of the ways that that field of communication are making a difference or perhaps adapting to the needs of our current situation? Thanks, Kama. Thanks for asking it. Um, yeah, and I think uh, from my point of view, because I'm a game designer, so I think game is quite a um, nice tool uh, to communicate. I can give you an example of what I did during the coronavirus. Um, because, you know, uh, the virus um, breakout in China, that was in January, and um, then a lot of uh, schools shut it down, and uh, the, the students cannot go to the public schools, so uh, they stay at home, and their parents stay at home as well, and then um, they don't know how to communicate with each other because normally uh, parents go to work and uh, students stay uh, in, uh, in a school. But now they gather together. And um, um, in China, we always say that family is the first class of the students. But actually when they stay together, uh, when the family, when, the, when their family house became the real classroom and they don't know how to use it. And so what can we do? And we find for Chinese parents, um, we, we interviewed several parents and, um, and uh, their kids. And then we find that um, they, they don't know how to spend quality time together, actually. So um, we made a game to help them to like um, how to spend time together. Um, um, we set up some goals and then they have to do it together and um, uh, how to use their time efficiently. So actually uh, that project uh, went out quite well and we, we used this game in Wuhan city, which is the, the, um, um, the first city that um, have the coronavirus. And then over, I also gave, gave a lecture and uh, online and over, uh, 380,000 um, parents and the kids um, was online for listening to the, to the lecture. So um, for me, that games are kind of good tool to communicate. Um, and I can also talk about uh, um, another example later um, about a hospital. And uh, um, because I'm a uh, educator and working in the university. So I always focused on the, on the education field. And now I'm also working on another project to um, help uh, somehow the, the, the kids from very poor families. Um, because of the, the coronavirus, um, some of them, some of their parents have to go home, uh, cannot work in Beijing for like for in the future. So if the parents went back home and the kids need to um, went back home as well, go back to, to their own city. And so how can we help this kind of people to stay in Beijing? How, how can we help the students? Uh, this is what I'm working on as well. I'm also thinking of making, making games and making some money for them. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much for, for that. Very interesting that you pick um, the first game. Is really, the first game is related to the first city that uh, the coronavirus outbreak in, in Wuhan. That's very interesting. Um, I think 
I definitely resonate with uh, gamification as tool to communicate. And I feel like maybe rather than, uh, because there's two school of thoughts, like should we encourage digitalization as part of communication for young children or even school students? Or can we integrate digitalization with effective communication? Maybe that's a, another view for that. And using gamification and games as tool and platform to communicate is actually quite a cool idea. Thank you for that, um, uh, Lin Lin. Last um, person that I want to ask, but not the last question yet. Yeah, uh, Dr. Satyan, uh, you specialize in healthcare. Um, as digital technologies play a growing role in healthcare, um, human-centered design is gaining quite a bit of traction in global um, health. What do you have to say on how human-centered design or innovation, human-centered innovation, impacting the global health equity? Yeah, thank you, Kama. That's a, that's a very very big question, um, and uh, probably you know beyond. Um, any amount of time to cover it sort of with any uh, detail. So I'll make a couple of points, but before I do that, I think, um, you know, because uh, being the being the one healthcare uh, practitioner on the panel, um, I, I think it's important to recognize, I mean, I, I'm, I'm careful that if I say something that um, is, you know, um, uh, listened to by a healthcare audience, um, you know, there's a lot of healthcare systems that are, um, Sort of in survival mode now, and they're sort of groaning under the weight of this pandemic, and um, and so things that might be suggesting innovations are just survival in some ways, and so I think it's just worthwhile remembering that uh, this is happening across the world; it's still happening now, and uh, people are sort of in this existential phase of just trying to get through this. But um, I think with that out of the way, I think there's 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 two ways of looking at this. I think the concept of digital technologies and the impact that that's bringing. Um, to health equity. I mean, there's um, even, even before, uh, I suppose, the pandemic broke, um, we were seeing considerable um, um, uh, lots of examples of, um, of, of, of digital technologies helping um, get services to underserved communities, sort of reducing the tyranny of distance um, and, um, you know, making it more accessible for people who might have um, been disadvantaged uh, as far as trying to get to bricks and mortar style healthcare settings. So there's always been this trend. Um, the pandemic has certainly accelerated that trend um, in, in many ways. Um, but I would describe that rather than um, as an example of human-centered innovation, I think it's, it's, it's really a byproduct of market forces um, um, uh, that that have been enabled, sort of market uh, dynamics that have been enabled by um, the advent of digital technologies. So we find that um, there have been opportunities to get services where they weren't um, previously available, and um, the digital technologies have come and filled that void. Um, I think it's important to recognize there's been um, a, a massive transformation because of that. But at the same time, there's a huge unmet need for intentional design as, as Juliana was talking about. Um, I think um, there, um, the, the sort of the biggest area where we sh can, should have been seeing a lot more already and especially during the pandemic is this area of integrating these, um, these digital technologies um, into the messy realities of the complex world that we live in. Um, and these are all design opportunities and I don't believe um, human-centered design philosophies of, and, and expertise have had the opportunity to really get alongside some of this work. It's been done in quite an ad hoc manner. And I think that's one of those key areas that, um, you know, is an untapped opportunity. And then we really have to try and find ways um, of, of advancing um, the human-centered design ethos into, into those conversations. Um, and I think uh, the the idea of the of liminality as Juliana spoke about is, is really quite quite interesting because it represents this phase where um, you know your identity is unfreeze and you want healthcare to look like into the future um, and how do we go about it using an intentional process rather than an ad hoc reactive process. Um, I will also say from the human factors systems um, sort of background that I bring one of the the key things that this pandemic has really showcased or highlighted is the need to design for adaptability and resilience. Um, much of how the systems have been set up, have been proven, 
um, not all of it, but some major aspects of it have been found to be quite unsuited for the kind of situation we find ourselves in. And it's really through adaptation and flexibility and, and bouncing back uh, that this, these systems have been able to meet the need uh, of the time they find themselves in. And I think these are huge design opportunities as well. How do we create um, system characteristics so that systems can be resilient and can adapt um, to an ever-changing uncertain world? And if anything can be certain, it's that you know this wouldn't be the next, the, the sort of the last pandemic we have to deal with or uh, a crisis of a global scale. So I think that's probably something I'll leave, um, I'll leave the panel with. Um, yeah, I might stop there. And if there's other questions, I'll come back to it later. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satyan. I understand what your kind of challenges in, in healthcare. I feel like conceptually, human-centered design or human-centered you know, innovation is perhaps uh, one of the answers to creating um, changes or you know responding to the global health equity. Uh, but the question is, do we have enough people equipped with that skills and mentality and approach? Um, so I think that's an area where, I mean, like as a member of GDTA, those are the questions that we are also asking. How can we create more of these people to help, you know, bring that objective closer? Uh, thank you, Dr. Satyan. And I, I know it's very difficult to talk about healthcare because there's basically just so many layers of that that we can cover. Um, I would like to bring our attention back to Prof. Uh, uh, no, uh, Juliana again, uh, since, since Satyan uh, mentioned a few times her name. So Juliana, um, we can agree that innovative capability does not emerge voluntarily. Um, it either are environmental factor or kind of like intentionally cultivated. Um, and it also depends on a certain degree on organizational environment. Uh, to what extent that this crisis we are facing uh, impacting change in organizational environment for innovation? So I would like to stop just on that question. So how maybe you can share with us based on your work um, in ECHOS, um, how is this crisis impacting change in organizational environment? Uh, maybe making them a little bit more ready for innovation or maybe they're even more scared for innovation. <laughs> Thank you, Kama. That's a, that's a great question. And, and thank you, Satya. I just wanted to bring one point from what Satya was saying. Um, I think that we all from the innovation world or from the design world, we're probably, we were probably tired of listening to the VUCA, right? So volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. But now we're seeing a completely different scale and depth of that, right? So now we're seeing and absolutely, now it's like, okay, now this is VUCA, right? We thought that our world was volatile and certain, complex and ambiguous, but now it's in, in a whole other level, right? So I think that sometimes um, some concepts and some, uh, let's say, evolutions and innovation strategies, they are maybe sometimes even too sophisticated for their time, right? And now that we are in a crisis, it's time to kind of apply things that maybe were too different and too hard. So what I am seeing from the organization, and that's what you asked about the innovation capability, what we have been um, using to understand this innovation capability for a while, we created some sort of like a design and innovation uh, maturity assessment for these organizations, right? So we try to understand what are the maturity regarding design and innovation so, and there are things and how we see it. So first we try to assess if they are user centric, if they actually do search and then they embrace that to apply that into their product services and the leadership embraces. Are they collaborative? Uh, do they work cross-functionally? Um, are they experimenting new ideas? Um, are they moving fast, uh, being okay for a failure and then moving fast for better results? Is design part of their culture, right? Um, for fostering creative collaboration? Do they have, do the organization has design literacy? So these are some things that kind of let us know what kind of maturity is this organization. And depending on, and why I'm saying that is that depending on their maturity, innovation means something very different for them, right? Um, so innovation, uh, it depends on your perspective or where you are in your maturity. 
because sometimes innovation is something very simple if you are sort of like in the basics, you are more traditional or something like that. And then creating a, a, a bit of a change, being a bit more user-centric is very disruptive, innovative maybe for you. Um, and what we have been seeing is that definitely now many businesses have been impacted um, and the, the innovation capability of these, these organizations are put in, in, in check, right? Are you able to adapt and pivot soon? Are you able to create something that is going to be creating value for these customers or partners that are in a completely different, let's say, context? Um, so I think that from what you were saying before, Kama, uh, before sometimes organizations and even ourselves, it seems like we were blindfolded, right? It was there in front of us of what were the needs, what we needed to do. And now because things are augmented, it's kind of like, oh, okay. I know that, I mean, it's very crazy. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were, oh my God, what's happening and stuff like that. But now I'm starting to see more and more clarity of where we should be going, of what are the things. So what 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 it makes sense for your business. So I think that people now are more open to trying new things because we are in a new situation basically. So think about it, for example, as an analogy, when you travel, when you used to travel before COVID, when you travel, you are in a different context. And because you are in a different context, you usually experiment more things, right? So usually you try new food that you wouldn't try at your home. You, I don't know, experiment a new activity or stuff like that. Because you are in a new context, a new context, you're out of your comfort zone. And this is the same what it, the, the, the same situation is happening with businesses, right? And organizations and people and communities and society and ever not only organizations, right? So for the whole let's say uh, ecosystem that that we live on. So I think that I wanna, my time, I think it's over, but I just wanted to close um, that now because we are in this VUCA super crazy moment, um, the VUCA, the volatile stuff, all of these things. Um, and because we are in a place where we can redesign everything that was not working we have such a big opportunity that we can redesign things. But I just wanted to make a point that for us to redesign things that are gonna be desirable and in interesting, we need to make it ethical and diverse because usually we are, and I know we are, a lot of people are talking about it and it's hard to do it. I do honor that, that it's very hard to do it, but we need to uh, bring the people who are not privileged enough usually to co-create what is going to be the next step to be part, to be part of this conversation. And this is being human-centered. This, is being, this is being society-centric. This is what is going to probably, hopefully, makes us evolve as a society and as a business as well, right? Um, we were sometimes afraid to be a more, even for, for us, uh, I'm talking about myself, my organization, we wanted to be more distributed as an organization, but it was hard because the the world uh, worked in a different way, but now we can try. Now is the time, right? So I'll stop now because I think I'm over time. Sorry, come. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, completely. And because of that, because of that, this is possible. What we are doing right now, uh, having panel discussions from different countries at the same time, uh, and it's it's all possible because of that. Before this, we will find every opportunity to actually travel and have some face-to-face -face session. Right now. We don't have any choice. <laughs> Thank you for that, Juliana. Um, Prof. Yvonne, community change, a very interesting topic. I think even the first Admiral Bahardin in the keynote speaker session one and even the keynote session two actually talk about this community change and even Juliana echoed the same thing. Um, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, the repercussion of COVID-19 with lockdown, social distancing, job lost, etc., is perpetuating. You don't know when it's going to end. In your view, how have communities changed or responded to the scenario? Or perhaps you can also share your view about how public sector is responding towards this public service delivery in terms of community. And is there any collaboration that happens? Um, yeah, go ahead, Prof. Great question, Karma. Um, and, and, and you're right, like there's a, there's a lot of challenges out there. There's unemployment, there's job losses, there's uncertainty. We're seeing older people in particular, but all people 
you know, get and die from the virus and uh, people are unable in Australia and America, unable to visit their relatives in aged care homes and having to actually have Zoom videos as people have died, unable, unable then to bury their parents, having virtual funerals, like things, uh, we're living in these really unusual times. Um, having said all that, I am very much an optimist. Um, so it was really great. I agreed a lot with what Juliana had to say about you know, organizational restructuring and, 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 and change in a positive way. And I think we're seeing that at a societal level and, and lots of different facets. So we think of individuals and we touched on this before, many, not all, but many individuals are taking this moment to take a pause and to reassess their lives and how they're living their lives. You know, and if I could, if I had a magic wand, um, I would love us to change how we work so that we no longer have a five day a week, that we legislate a four day a week or even less than that. And we actually have a bit more balance uh, and time for volunteering and connecting the community and those partnerships and just, you know, that movement towards, you know, slow living and so slower lifestyles. I think that's really, really, you know, something we could take a greater advantage of. Um, here in Australia, we're well, depending on what state you live in, um, some of us are more back to normal than others. And it, it does, it's, it's, it's quite funny how quickly the things that you took, you know, that COVID took away from you, your ability to go out and eat and to live and to work from home and all those things, you know, all those things, you kind of take them for granted, you know, quite quickly you get back to a to normal life. Um, and so I think we really have to make sure that we don't go back all that way. Um, so we need to rethink yeah, we need to rethink how we live. We need to take as an opportunity to for, for positive change and, and push for that in, in all um, in all aspects of our lives and really push for that kind of innovation. Like we know that um, whilst some of our ED departments, emergency departments and hospitals are struggling, others have seen reduced admissions uh, because people are worried about COVID. So we can you know, when we're using more telehealth and, and these kind of, you know, virtual connections. So there's lots of positives that, is, that are going to come out of what is a really scary, life-changing uh, pandemic. So, but we've got to harness those. And we as designers and the design community and thought leaders and change agents actually have a responsibility to, to lead that conversation. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Better stop talking. Oh, can't, we can't hear you, Kama. My shortcut is not working. Uh, okay. You have more time, actually, probably one, so don't worry about it. Yes, um, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else to add or you're okay? I'm, Correct. I'm sure I'm longer before so someone else can have it. Lynn can have more time. Sure, sure. Um, I feel like that's definitely true um, in this case. Um, there's so many things that it's unexpected, but there's so many also beautiful things that happens along with that. And I feel like we are so much more connected with the term design, or maybe we are just that community who believe in the term design. Like you can basically design everything. You can design your morning, you can design your sleep, you can design everything. So yeah, having more designers <laughs> in our society will definitely make it positive and sustainable change. Um, Next up, I feel like we have a question for Dr. Satyan. Um, so Dr. Satyan, coming back to what you said on the healthcare, and I know it's a, a heavy kind of topic, but it's also very important uh, because it's related back to public service delivery and also public sector. Um, and because our track in Kuala Lumpur is kind of like focusing a little bit on the public sector innovation and so on like that. Um, when we are looking at the healthcare system, do you see a need in amplifying the integration of the design disciplines into healthcare improvement efforts? And if that's not the case, um, what do you have to say about um, your own case. experience? Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you have to say about the public sector innovation in healthcare, probably? Yeah, look, um, I might, might start with the first part of that question. Uh, and, you know, I... I obviously come from a different uh, perspective on design. And I've, you know, through lots of interaction and collaboration with Yvonne, I've been sort of getting more of a um, immersion in the creative design disciplines. But I think when I first read Don Norman's um, The Design of Everyday Things, and this is during my um, human factors um, engineering um, fellowship, 
it was really interesting that he describes um, design as communication. And, you know, if you think about um, sectors that are essentially, you know, that's, that's the core, the core um, business of a sector. I mean, nothing gets um, close to that than healthcare. I mean, healthcare is all about communication, all of our safety critical um, um, problems that we experience usually are from communication breakdowns, whether it's between teams, whether it's between technology and teams, technology and technology, the sort of integration question, which is sort of also uh, a communication question um, is, is, is this rife across healthcare? And so if you start looking at that, you know, every interaction between a patient and a clinician, um, you know, can, can benefit from a designed approach towards how that actually is undertaken. Um, you know, you look at our health system, we've got 80,000 staff um, and we, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you how many units of service. It's a massive opportunity to uh, integrate the design disciplines into, into that conversation at various levels. I mean, it's not, um, you know, I'm not just talking about um, from bringing a design thinking type approach, but I'm just saying actual hard design work from specialized disciplines right from industrial design through to architectural design, through to um, you know, visual communication design, how we provide information to our patients so that you know, we're sort of trying to actively break down the power dynamics and structures that sit there that disempower patients right from before they've even spoken to the clinician. You know? And uh, I think several people mentioned uh, you know, uh, taking an ethical perspective, we have some of the most um, uh, the larger disparities in healthcare uh, in, in healthcare outcomes are actually in Australia with the First Nations communities, and so um, there's there's huge opportunities there. And I think it's not just about uh, increased integration of the design disciplines. It's also, um, like Juliana said, uh, you know, uh, actually tackling the design literacy. We we as clinicians uh, often don't know what we don't know, and uh, one of my colleagues often talks about this as you know, we um, we, we wouldn't let people onto a plane with a, you know, with a spanner and say, just improve it on the way. And uh, before you get off, you know, we don't do that. We expect those competencies and um, skills that are required as part of it. But uh, we expect clinicians to do a large chunk of the healthcare improvement happens by people who don't have any specific training on how to improve systems and uh, design's a big part of that. So I think there's, um, this is sort of the journey that we're on with the design lab. Um, we've just embarked on a very, sort of a 12 month intensive period of collaboration where we're getting design interns into healthcare. Um, so design students, we're getting designers and residents, we'll have project mentorships. And the whole idea is not to, you know, source uh, people who can do work for us, but it's more about understanding what does this partnership look like? What do these models look like? How do we, how do we uh, you know, create these cross-functional teams and make sure they work well because we don't even have the shared language sometimes. Um, but we need all the help we can get. And so I think uh, the design disciplines are a big part of that. Um, yeah, so I think um, that that's sort of my sense about the first part of the question. Um, and so what was the second part? I missed the second part. It was, uh, sorry, you're on. Public there. sector, public service delivery on in healthcare. Yeah, so innovation, public sector, public service delivery. I mean, I think, you know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, um, you know, we're, we're quite different in some ways, you know, I work in a public health system and, uh, you know, different countries have different models that they, uh, you know, um, Australia and say the, the UK and Canada have very strong public healthcare systems. Um, and I think um, th there is always an opportunity to, to deal with some of the um, structural bureaucracies that come from working in, in, in public uh, in public sector to actually enable um, you know the design approach and to, to try and innovate in that space um, we COVID has been a great catalyst for that um, because um, it's taken away the you know the sometimes the uh, the narrative that exists that where the power lies in the system in healthcare it's, it's with clinicians and uh, and I think it's been a, it's been a great catalyst to to refocus um, the support systems um, at higher levels of uh, of healthcare to really get down to uh, supporting the real business of the system. So it's been good in that sense in this country. Um, so I think yeah, there's huge opportunities within the public sector for for design innovation. Uh, healthcare is no different. I think uh, our needs are greater, 
than other other aspects of the public um, the public public services. Thank you for that, Tatian. Um, um, yeah, I agree. For 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 example, in our country, um, the innovation plan or direction that we've we've gone towards is more on the fi financial healthcare innovation. Um, there has been talks about um, innovating insurance uh, because the healthcare financial resource and budget is just extremely uh, high pressure on the country's development and you know where we're recovering economy and we're also losing a lot of money for the healthcare but if you don't that do that healthcare is not an option it's basically a need for economy to basically move forward and one of the most heated discussion that we have is how about we create a co-op or a not-for-profit insurance agency that you know every um, um, person in the country will have to pay up front uh, the, the amount of healthcare that is calculated as an average for each person so that um, the country does not have to basically absorb all this pressure of financial. Um, so definitely a very challenging time, especially for healthcare, because I remember uh, this article that healthcare and being healthy is not basically a choice, a priority or anything else. It's basically a, a prerequisite for any kind of development. If you don't have that, you can basically just forget about anything like education or whatnot. So it's, it's quite interesting. Um, we are now on the last one is uh, Lin Lin. Uh, I hope you don't mind, I call you Lin Lin, uh, Miss, Mrs. Shui Lin Lin. Uh, we have been talking about public in general, businesses and healthcare. Uh, we'll talk about uh, education community and you talk about how families are actually coping with the communication aspect. Um, I want to also zoom in a little bit with your topic just now. Let's talk about the youth or our younger generation. Do you observe a trend or changes in how our younger generation communicate um, their experiences in facing this global pause? Um, I would like to kind of uh, view or maybe on your, on your country or the side of the world, how does it look like for this youth to communicate or express their feelings? Uh, because for, from our side point of view, mental issues or mental health has been quite a, receiving quite a spike actually uh, especially amongst youth because of this lockdown and and all this disconnection with human interactions um, and one of the key things that we see changes is there's a lot more platform uh, digitally to help people communicate and express their feelings um, so maybe you can talk a little bit more about that Lindin. Uh, thanks, Kama, for asking this. Um, actually, in, in China, we uh, did we in, we encountered the problem of um, like communication with uh, others, um, and uh, we're also facing some problems of uh, like the, the mental health. Um, so, uh, for example, in my university, um, we have a special department and we have like three, uh, uh, three experts who can help students to, um, to uh, like speak out and also um, help them to encounter this kind of uh, mental disease in this special area. And so they can call these experts uh, 24 hours per day. And um, um, yeah, and, and some of the experts, they really, they, they had their, their uh, data that uh, uh, which student uh, might have some problem. I don't know how they gather the data, but they, they, they have kind of, okay, alert. And then they will call the students. And also, um, they will let the professors know. For example, if uh, it is, if he or she is a um, graduate student, and then the the uh, professor, the the host professor will uh, will get the information. And also, the professor are suggested to talk to the student. So um, yeah, we are very sorry to see that some of the one of my student. Um, uh, cure herself uh, in the in the in the 
in the last uh, last month, I think. But uh, actually, um, yeah, we are facing it, and uh, um, and the young students they can use different kind of digital apps like WeChat, like TikTok in, in China, we call it um, Douyin, this kind of uh, communication tools yeah, to make some funny videos. And also they can have their WeChat group. Um, yeah, they can help each other as well. Um, so um, yeah, we do have this kind of problem here and we, uh, we are trying to deal with it. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much, um, Lin Lin. Very interesting in terms of the communication. And I noticed uh, quite a, I've also mentioned this with the Minister of Tourism just now, where we noticed that the communication style for women leaders, uh, for uh, countries who is led by women has been super effective and I wonder why. <laughs> um, so we are actually at the tail end of the panel discussion. I have one more question and it's, uh, it's up for anyone who's interested to answer. So the final question for the day, um, open to anybody, uh, maybe we can say who, who unmute first, they can answer. <laughs> how would you best, so the question is, how would you best summarize the lesson we can learn as a member of the public from this unprecedented time that hit us. What is the summary of the lesson that we can learn as a member of the public? Anybody can answer that. Oh, please, someone answer that. <laughs> uh, it's um, open for anybody. Um, what can you learn? That we can choose how we respond to things so that there is an external crisis going on, but we can choose how we show up uh, for ourselves, for our family members, for our colleagues, for our neighbours. So we can choose our behaviours and our responses. Um, so I think it's really important that we can actually take some, a little bit of control out of an unknown thing um, and actually model appropriate behaviours and model the things that we want to see. And so we can actually turn a crisis into something that can be community building um, and we can get to, we can get through this together. And I think that most of the time, uh, for the vast majority of times, we are seeing that kind of uh, positivity. Um, you know, we see a lot of people giving back to those at the the front row, the front line, to the teachers and the emergency room doctors and the nurses and the cleaners and the taxi drivers and the bus drivers. And do you know what I mean? Everybody who's got a critical job. Um, well, I think we're coming together to support them, and so that's what we need to remember to do. Thank you so much. Um, so that's the end of our panel discussion. We are going to move to question and answers right now. So I'm opening it to the stage. Uh, let's see, members of the audience, you can ask questions to the panelists uh, right on the chat over there. Oh, we have the first one. Faith Ng, the question is, is there a question? Oh yes, there is. The question for Lin Lin and Dr. Satyan. Um, first, Faith said, thanks plenty for the insights from all panelists. So the question is, I'm a consultant speech language pathologist. What are the current thoughts on gamification in special education and disability? For example, integrating tech into enhancing learning, communication and health outcomes. I'll repeat the question. Um, someone can copy in the chat. Uh, I repeat the question. I'm a consultant speech language pathologist. What are the current thoughts on gamification in special education and disability? For Lin Lin and Dr. Satya. Well, I, I can start. I mean, um, I started out as a pediatric occupational therapist. Um, and, uh, and 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 actually did a lot of work with children who had autism. That was my my sort of my first first area of practice. I must say that, that was uh, in the pre digital era. Um, so this was you know just on the turn of the millennium, and so I don't um, have a lot of current um, understanding of where special education and sort of I mean there's there's obviously a lot that I come across, but. I couldn't give a meaningful answer 
about what is cutting edge in that space. So I'm, I'm going to pass that on to Lin Lin. Um, hello. Um, I, I also actually, I don't have the experience of um, special education or disability, but I do have some experience in um, like the privilege um, uh, like from the poor uh, area students or uh, like uh, they are isolated from their parents. Uh, because in a, in a rural area in China, you know, their parents will go out to work in big cities and then the kids are left in a rural area and then they have to uh, live there with their grandparents for like 10 years without seeing their own parents. And so they have some like, um, uh, they, they miss their parents a lot and uh, uh, they have to deal with themselves uh, with, with uh, like, what about um, if, what if my grandparents die and uh, what, can, what can I do? Um, so what this kind of problems? So what can games uh, can help with those, um, those students? Uh, we, we, we actually did one more project uh, with the students in, in Sichuan in uh, Southeast China. Um, so um, we, we finally, we, we let them to draw, uh, like to draw um, different kinds of pictures like drawing diary. Uh, that's a, a kind of um, uh, like emotional collection with the nature, with uh, observing, like, like in the day I'm thinking, observing the surroundings and uh, um, they build up relationship with uh, what they have. They have the nature, they have their teachers, they have their friends, they have animals, uh, and, and then they, they are more like released. And um, they also can show in this kind of picture to their parents to tell them their daily life. And they also practice visual skills as well. So um, um, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of game um, between the students because they pass the, the, the diary, the visual diary um, among the students. Like you take one, um, one day, uh, like a visual diary, and then you pass it to the next student and then the next one doing the next day. And then um, like after 30 days, they have a they have a, a, a class diary, something like this. So um, yeah, I don't know whether I answered your question, but um, that's what the experience I have. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for asking. <laughs>